11 taxi drivers are dead following an ambush in South Africa. Ethiopia's prime minister calls for multi-party democracy. And news of a planned Vladimir Putin visit to the United States stuns Washington. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. South African police are investigating a deadly taxi shooting in KwaZulu Natal at the weekend. Eleven taxi drivers were killed and four others critically wounded when gunmen opened fire on their minibus. The drivers were returning from a colleague's funeral in KwaZulu Natal when they were ambushed between the towns of Colenso and Winen. Two people escaped unharmed. Police are looking into possible motives for Saturday's shooting. Minibus taxis are the most popular uh, form of transportation in South Africa. More than 200,000 of them operate nationally, carrying some 15 million people each day. Violence is common as rival groups battle for dominance on profitable routes and not serviced by buses or trains. The latest killings come just days after deadly shootings in Johannesburg. In Cape Town, taxi violence claimed the lives of 10 people over one weekend back in May. In East Africa, Al-Shabaab militants have carried out a deadly raid on a Somali military base in the lower Juba region nearly uh, early Monday. Officials told VOA the militants used two successful car bombs followed by an infantry attack on Sanguni camp about 50 kilometers north of Kismayu. Somali officials say four soldiers and at least eight militants were killed including two suicide bombers driving the two vehicles. According to Reuters, an Al-Shabaab official claimed, uh, claims 27 soldiers were killed. Mokhtar Abdi Mohammed, the unit commander with Somali forces in Sanguni, confirms that two suicide car bombs were used, but says the Somali forces destroyed them before they hit the base. Mohammed says 10 to 100 militants attacked the base from the north. The United States says it doubts South Sudan's President Salva Kiir and rebel leader Rick Machar have the leadership qualities needed to deliver peace to the country. In a statement, the White House said peace talks need to be more inclusive to succeed and that the U.S. would impose fresh sanctions on anyone who threatens the country's stability. Tens of thousands of people have been killed in a South Sudan civil war. In June, a U.S. drafted resolution at the United Nations Security Council imposed an arms embargo. Earlier this month, South Sudan's parliament voted to extend Kiir's mandate until 2021, a move condemned by the U.S. and which opp opposition groups say is illegal. Last week, Kiir said he is ready to accept a peace deal and set up an inclusive new government. The proposed deal would give the country five vice presidents and cover security and power sharing arrangements. The Ethiopian Prime Minister is calling on his country to pursue a multi-party democracy. The statement by the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff on Sunday could be the latest in a series of major changes sweeping the country. Abiy Ahmed became Prime Minister in April and since then the government has instituted reforms including releasing political prisoners, diluting state control of the economy and making peace with northern neighbour Eritrea. The country allows competing parties, but all parliamentarian, parliamentary seats are held by the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, which has maintained tight control in the country of 100 million people since it fought its way to power in 1991. The ruling coalition has also presided over an economy that has grown faster than any other in sub-Saharan Africa over the past decade. For more on the developments in Ethiopia, I'm joined in studio by VOA Solomon Abates. Solomon, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. Glad to now, be here. Of course, as we said, these announcements are coming rather rapidly. Uh, most people would say, well, Ethiopia is believed to be a democracy. Uh, what, what is missing? What is this multi-party uh, dimension that uh, Abi Abi is proposing? Um, well, you know, uh, Vincent, a multi-party system is n not a new talk for Ethiopia. EPRDF uh, uh,
tried to uh, invite several parties earlier, and uh, um, a lot of part over a hundred parties were operating in the country. However, EPRDF uh, became uh, the most dominant party, and uh, it uh, uh, chose the path of uh, uh, dictatorship, uh, and uh, that, that is what uh, brought this change about in the country. Now, this new prime minister is uh, promising a new atmosphere, political atmosphere, a new, uh, a wider room for participation for political parties, and he calls the political parties um, uh, not opposition parties, but competitors. Yes. So uh, now uh, you know uh, there is a change of attitude. Uh, in, in because the actually these opposition parties have been treated almost like they are an enemy of the state, right? Exactly. Yeah. That was what happened during the last 25 or so years. Yeah. You know, a lot of the leaders, the leaders of these opposition parties have been arrested and most of uh, them were forced to flee the country and even there were killings in uh, many occasions in the country. So this new prime minister is promising a different yeah. Course. Now, the people are looking at this, uh, whatever is happening in Ethiopia, and just wondering, is this the influence of Prime Minister Abiy, or is it that, in fact, the ruling coalition has reached a point where things changes have to happen? Because otherwise, we're not hearing any opposition within the ruling coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a good question. That is uh, something uh, that Ethiopians would like to see cautiously. Uh, the party didn't change its program. It didn't even change its name. It, it remains Revolutionary Democratic Front. Um, and uh, there are no changes in m major laws of the country, including the uh, election uh, law. Uh, but uh, within the party, there are some who support the, uh, the idea of the prime minister the idea of the change yeah. and uh, I didn't hear any opposition openly from within the party but uh, it is clear there are some hardliners who are not very content about what is being done by the Prime Minister so far. Yeah. From what you're hearing, uh, how is the reaction from the citizens across uh, Ethiopia and the diaspora? Do they get kind of a little dizzy from all these quick pronouncements? Um, it is a time of uh, big joy for Ethiopians, yeah. I think, a time of big uh, excitement. Uh, you know, the Prime Minister is enjoying unprecedented support and popularity among Ethiopians at home and in diaspora as well. Yeah. Never in Ethiopian history happened, you know, this. So. Uh, it's interesting. They are, uh, the Ethiopians everywhere yeah. are very happy with the change. Even they are pushing for more. <laughs> you know, there Definitely. are still pr political prisoners uh, who, are, who, who, yeah. who are behind bars. There are still some laws who must be abolished yeah. or uh, somehow uh, corrected, you know. The electoral law is one of them, the C so uh, we, civic we, society, we the terror law. Definitely we can expect much yeah. more and we know that uh, Prime Minister Abiy will be visiting Washington. Yeah. So we'll look forward to talking to you again about this. Thank, Thank you, you very Vincent. much, Solomon, for joining Thank us Thank you for today. having me. Well, that's uh, Solomon uh, Abate of uh, VOA, uh, Horn of Africa. Now, China's President uh, Xi Jinping started a four-nation visit to Africa Saturday in Senegal. Xi signed bilateral deals with the West African nation, which has a rapidly growing economy. China has been making investment loans and deals with African nations to help expand and improve infrastructure and gain access to materials and markets important to the Chinese economy. China already has major trade ties to the continent. Xi will also visit Rwanda, Mauritius and South Africa. In South Africa, he will meet with officials from others uh, other so-called uh, BRIC, uh, BRICS nations, major emerging economic, economic Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and South Africa. Now, the ancient iconic baobab tree with its distinctive solid trunk grows in many parts of Africa, but the trees raise, uh, rising out of the savanna in southern Africa today are dying at an alarming rate, and scientists are not sure why. 
According to a study published in the scientific journal Nature Plants, nine of the 13 baobabs between 1,000 and 2,500 years uh, have died over the past dozen years. VOA's Deborah Block takes us to Limpopo province in South Africa. A villager in South Africa's Limpopo province ponders over a dead collapsed baobab tree. The trees are a lifeline for many who live here. I'm very confused when those trees died because we, we get help from this tree, healing, and then food we get from these baobab trees. Shelter we get from baobab trees. This tree is estimated to be 1,200 years old. It is among the scores of baobabs that are dying at an alarming rate in South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Scientists say rising temperatures and drought caused by climate change may be the reason. In the southern areas of, of the baobab distribution, we see very few uh, juvenile trees, but at the same time, we're losing the mature trees. So what we're probably looking at here is a shift in their distribution in response to, to climate forcing. Baobabs are the largest flowering tree in the world and can grow more than 20 meters high. Their trunks and branches store large amounts of water sucked up during the rainy seasons. People use the tart fruit to make nutritious drinks and a yogurt-like food. It's like a type of medicine. We get energy from that thing. Baobabs are part of a larger ecosystem that supports countless animals, large and small. It's so important to the life of the people and the ecosystem. Perhaps it's time we start to, you know, put those species on the list of restoration priorities because we can plant species like, it's very easy to grow the seed of, um, to grow a plant from the seed of baobab for those who know to do it. Efforts to restore the ancient baobabs are growing more urgent as the magnificent trees that have stood here for millennia slowly disappear. Deborah Block, VOA News. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Still ahead on Africa 54. U.S. officials take measures to prevent meddling in America's 2018 midterm elections. But first, a look at Monday's headlines. Tour of the African continent and the United Arab Emirates. In South Africa, the Police Portfolio Committee warns that taxi violence has reached crisis levels following an ambush where 11 taxi drivers were killed and four others critically wounded when gunmen opened fire on their minibus. The Italian ambassador to Libya visits the new reception center of Ain Zara for illegal immigrants in Tripoli. In Zimbabwe, after years of political instability scared away tourists, former President Robert Mugabe's removal has revived the lagging industry. In Mozambique, sustainable farming methods are being promoted to counter the damage caused by traditional practice of creating new fields. U.S. President Donald Trump has warned Iranian President Hassan Rouhani to never threaten the United States in a Twitter comment late Sunday evening. Quote, to Iranian President Rouhani, never ever threaten the United States again or you will suffer consequences the likes of which few throughout history have ever suffered before. We are no longer a country that will stand for your demented words of violence and death. Be cautious. End quote. President Trump appeared to be uh, responding to reports earlier in the day, quoting Rouhani warning Trump, don't play with the lion's tail. This would only lead to regret. Trump's tweets uh, come, uh, came shortly after U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, gave a speech at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in California, critical of Iran's leaders. On the heels of President Trump's widely criticized Helsinki summit performance, Washington is a buzz yet again after the White House announced the Russian President Vladimir Putin will visit the United States later this year. Viewers Michael Bowman reports. Adding fuel to the fire, another Trump-Putin encounter is being planned, this time on American soil. 
The news caught President Trump's own intelligence chief by surprise. Say that again? <laughs> That's going to be special. <laughs> An official visit to Washington is an honor few U.S. lawmakers of either party believe Putin deserves. But Trump is firing back amid a continuing torrent of criticism of his ever-shifting pronouncements on Russian meddling in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. The president insisted on Twitter Sunday he had a great meeting with Putin in Helsinki and accused the, quote, fake news media of disparaging it, which he labeled bad for our country. Democrats begged to disagree. The talks in Helsinki were productive, but they were productive for Vladimir Putin. Uh, the reality is we have no idea what this president, our president, agreed to. Uh, we do know that after leaving that meeting and coming back home, the president undercut our commitment to the collective security of NATO. Uh, was that a topic of discussion, too? Did Montenegro come up? The Russian government, meanwhile, is casting the controversy as a petty American partisan brawl. Russia and Russian-American relations became a hostage of the internal political struggle between Democrats and Republicans. Unfortunately, this anti-Russian hysteria, this Russia-phobia, isn't showing any signs of decline in the U.S. At one point, I thought the level of anti-Russian rhetoric went down, but it doesn't stop. Late last week, the White House distanced itself from a Russian proposal that would allow the United States and Russia to question each other's citizens. Subjecting our diplomat to Putin's thuggery, that is an abuse of power. Uh, naive and absurd. Uh, there is no rule of law in Russia. There's the rule of Putin. Let this resolution be a warning. Sending a firm bipartisan message to the White House, the Senate unanimously approved a resolution opposing the questioning of current or former U.S. officials by the Russian government. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. Well, the midterm elections in the United States are less than four months away, and officials are putting into place a number of measures to prevent a repeat of the kind of Russian interference that U.S. intelligence discovered in the 2016 presidential elections. That includes a new announcement that notifies the public about foreign breaches. Here is VOA's Caroline Prusuti. Nothing is more sacred to democracy than fair and free elections. Voters trust that their votes count. But that expectation has been under attack since officials uncovered Russian interference in the 2016 elections. The first part of counter-strategy, say lawmakers, is to start with sanctions. We have passed sanctions on Russia to hold them accountable. And more importantly, what we intend to do is to make sure that they don't get away with it again. But time is running short. The November midterms, when voters typically weigh in on a new president's performance, by keeping or replacing lawmakers on Capitol Hill is almost here. The second part of the strategy is more federal money for election security. This amendment responds by providing for us to partner with our states to slam the door in the face of the Russian bear or any other adversary who seeks to steal the integrity of our elections. The Department of Justice is now alerting the public about foreign meddling in elections. This strategy, voter vigilance. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein says cyber criminals targeted 21 states in the last election. There's no evidence that any foreign government has ever altered vote totals, but the risk is real. Meantime, administration critics fault President Trump for not hosting a special task force or reappointing a cybersecurity chief. Brookings analyst Elaine Kmark says inaction could result in, well, being taken over by Russia. I mean, having people who are either consciously or unconsciously beholden to a foreign power which does not believe in democracy. President Trump says his administration is doing everything in its power to prevent Russian interference in the next election. They have just over 100 days to develop new strategies to do that. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News at the White House.
Welcome back to Africa 54 and here's what's trending. 30-something ambitious Nigerians are increasingly turning to farming as a career. Unlike their parents' generation which sought its fortune in oil, farming is a growth sector in this gigantic country with nearly 180 million mouths to feed. These young people are convinced that Nigeria's future will depend on massive investments in agriculture, a long and neglected sector where there are millions of dollars to be earned and as many jobs to create, but the challenges are many. Nigeria has a primarily low-skilled workforce and intermittent electricity. Next up, aim and fire. The schoolboys are leading the fight against deforestation with a new weapon, slingshots. It's part of an initiative by Seed Balls Kenya, which encourages children to have slingshots competitions using the charcoal-covered seeds instead of stones. About two million seed balls have been planted in Kenya in the past year and half in what has been called guerrilla gardening. By soaking charcoal dust mixture in water, a seed is exposed for germination upon disintegration of the seed ball. The seed balls help in moisture retention around the seed, while cassava dust contains sugars and minerals that are essential for seed germination. And finally, a rural enclave in South Africa set up after the end of apartheid is launch, launching its own digital currency. The Africana town of Irania already uses its own money and it's now teaming up with an economist to roll out an electronic version. The aura is essentially a, coup a coupon pegged to the South African rand. Transaction costs for the e-aura or electronic aura are only 0.5%, which compares favorably to bank charges in South Africa and globally. While the e-aura is not a cryptocurrency, it could eventually be worth a whole lot more to the community of Oranium. And that's what is trending today. Now, if there can be a driverless car uh, on the road, why not driverless boats on the water? Fade Lapidus has details of a team building a robotic boat, which uh, what they want it to do. This USV, unmanned surface vehicle, on this Florida waterway is being put through its paces. Like other remote-controlled boats, this catamaran can be controlled by an operator on shore. But the team can also put it into autonomous mode, throwing virtual obstacles in its path to test how successfully it assesses risk and navigates complex environments on its own. As it encounters obstacles, then it has to detect them, it has to figure it out how big those obstacles are, and then it has to execute avoidance maneuver to make sure that it do doesn't bump into the obstacles. With a human at the controls, USVs could take tasks like bridge inspection, environmental monitoring, and search and rescue to new levels. An autonomous USV could do even more. Once we can make them autonomous, then we can go beyond simple surveillance tasks. We can actually perform search, rescue, recovery, and then also, you know, basically transport cargo or clean up debris. So there are lots of other things can happen. In the end, team members say their work, supported by the National Science Foundation, is about expanding human ability by engineering robots to do time-consuming or dangerous work with minimal supervision and making them easy to use. I think that, realistically speaking, there are certain things that uh, you always want a person to do. At the same time, though, robots can be built to go into much more extreme environments. Just like with every machine, if it's not easy for people to use, then it's not going to be widely adopted. And so the more natural the interaction can be, I, I feel that the more likely it will be to be more broadly adopted. The researchers are working toward a day when fleets of robotic boats will partner with humans to make working on the water more efficient, safer, and less expensive. I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. Well, the American Accordi Accordionists Association celebrates its 80th anniversary this year, gathering in Alexandria, Virginia, to showcase performers of all uh, ages and abilities. Here is VOA's Jill Craig. It's an annual festival for accordion players from the U.S. and beyond to show off their skills and share ideas. Some have just started learning, while others have been playing for years. But those of my age group and they're in, who are in their 60s and 70s, the accordion schools were enormous back then. And a lot of families, you know, they couldn't afford a piano. They had a very small apartment. 
that they could get a little accordion for their kids. And their children would join the accordion orchestras in their schools, and then they would compete. Many, like Alex Hoodley, believe that a resurgence is slowly gaining traction in the United States. Hoodley has been playing the accordion since he was a child, and his son Peter carries on the family tradition. Being from um, an ethnic uh, background, I've, I've grown up in a, a Ukrainian community uh, all my life with children's groups and resorts and the Catskills and stuff like that. And actually, from the age of 15 to 23, I had a house band or, or played in the house band at the resort. So I loved the folk music. It was all around me. The accordion was also a part of Frank Busso Jr.'s childhood. He started playing at age five, and now, as the accordionist for the U.S. Air Force Band's Strolling Strings, he says he uses the instrument for diplomatic purposes. You know, there are some, some times when we might show up to a dinner at the chief of staff's house, and uh, you know, the, there might be some tension between our leaders and, and the leaders of the visiting nation, and then we'll go into the residence and perform a selection or two from that guest nation's, uh, from from the guest nation, from the from the hometown, perhaps of, of the leader, and all of a sudden, it seems like the tension goes away a little bit. Lou Capola, who received the American Accordionists Association Lifetime Achievement Award, played the accordion in the Air Force Band for 28 years. During that time, he entertained nine different U.S. presidents and hundreds of heads of state. Capola recalls that the accordion's popularity in the U.S. diminished because of the Beatles, as more young people began preferring the guitar. As for his own playing style, Coppola says he favors classical to avoid accordion stereotypes. It's interesting, uh, I go out of my way not to play polkas for that reason, because people think that's all you do. Or the other thing is people used to always say, oh, you play accordion, play Lady of Spain. Well, I purposely avoid Lady of Spain, I purposely avoid polkas. Not that there's anything wrong with them if played properly, it's just a stigma that's been attached to both of those selections with the accordion. But no matter what kind of music is played, the accordionists here are hopeful that the younger generation will continue the musical tradition. Jill Craig, VOA News, Alexandria, Virginia. Well, and that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com for more news. Tune in to VOA's evening radio show Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC and in the mornings today break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us in Washington. Have a good night. in a minute. So you know what happy is, and medium comes between small and large. To find a happy medium. So is this idiom about feeling kind of happy? How is it going with your neighbor? Is he still complaining about your playing the trombone at night? Mm, he was, but it's fine now. How did you guys work it